The following message is made available for you by Emanuel Baptist Church in Mora, Minnesota. For more information, visit us online at www.emmanuelmora.com. But 1 Samuel 5, this is what the Holy Spirit tells us. After the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod, brought it into the Temple of Dagon, and placed it next to his statue. When the people of Ashdod got up early the next morning, there was Dagon, falling, uh, fallen with his face to the ground before the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and turned him back to and, and uh, returned him back to his place. But when they got up early the next morning, there was Dagon, fallen with his face to the ground before the Ark of the Lord. This time, Dagon's head and both his hands were broken off and lying on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso remained. That is why, still today, the priests of Dagon and everyone who enters the temple of Dagon and Ashdod do not step on Dagon's threshold. The Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod. He terrified the people with Ashdod and its territory and afflicted them with tumors. When the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, The ark of Israel's God must not stay here with us because his hand is strongly against us and against our God, Dagon. So they called all the Philistine rulers together and asked, What should we do with the ark of Israel's God? The ark of Israel's God should be moved to Gath, they replied. So they moved the ark of Israel's God. And after they had moved it, the Lord's hand was against the city of Gath, causing it, uh, uh, causing a great panic. He afflicted the people of the city from the youngest to the oldest with the outbreak of tumors. The people of Gath then sent the ark to Ekron. Uh, but where, when it got there, the Ekronites cried out, they've moved the ark of Israel's God to us to kill us and our people. The Ekronites called all the Philistine rulers together and they said, send the ark of Israel's God away. Let it return to, the, to its place so it won't kill us and our people. For the fear of death pervaded the city and God's hand was oppressing them. Those who did not die were afflicted with tumors and the outcry of the city went up to heaven. And we'll see what happens with that next week. But for now, let's pray and then ask God's blessing on this and then we'll see what he has to say. Father, we uh, bless you. We, we look at you as holy as you are. And so, Father, I pray that as we look at this ancient story of what you did in Philistine uh, territory, would you help us to see that you are a God without borders and that you will see to it that your name is praised in every nation with every tongue and every tribe. God, would you uh, do that work starting right here in Mora, Lord? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It was usually on a warm and sunny June Saturday that I would have to skip my Saturday morning cartoons to go sit in the outfield of our little league park and pick grass with my teammates until it was time for us to go up and, and be recognized. Uh, and the older I got, the longer that we had to wait because they had every single team from kindergarten all the way up through sixth grade that would uh, go up and be uh, recognized. They'd have your name announced, and then everybody was going to leave with a trophy. And it has become somewhat of, of an issue lately in pop culture, but back in uh, the uh, 1980s, uh, Richfield Little League, it didn't matter if you were on a team that didn't place any position. It didn't matter if you fell out of the playoffs in the first round. Uh, you were going to get a trophy. And so when I would get that trophy, I would uh, put it on the shelf uh, for uh, the rest of my childhood to remind me that I was part of something. And through the years, the shelf would get pretty cluttered uh, with trophies and game balls and ribbons and certificates for various things. And it would be a, a visual snapshot of uh, who I was and what my life was like at that time. But the thing that I started to learn was that the more uh, items that I got to display what I had done, the less value and meaning every single one of them had. Because whereas this trophy I got when maybe I was in second or third grade, now that didn't mean as much anymore as the one that I had gotten when I was in, in sixth grade. Uh, but uh, these were here all visual representations of my interests in my life. And all of them were nothing more than unrelated uh, fragments of who I was at that time. 
Now, if you're a kid or maybe a teen, perhaps you have a shelf like this. Maybe it's your dresser and you have it on the counter of your dresser with trophies and, and things like that. If you're an adult, more than likely you have traded uh, the shelf or the top of the dresser uh, to having a trophy case uh, inside you. You have a trophy case in your, in your heart. It's intrinsic. Uh, it is there that you may have placed your most important um, things that make you essentially who you are. Maybe you have one spot in there for being a mom or a dad or being a, a grandpa or a grandma. Maybe you have one there for uh, the amount of, of money that you make uh, throughout the year. Maybe you have one for having a boat and being a good, a good fisherman. Maybe uh, there's a spot on there for your finance and retirement package that you're looking forward to whatever day that comes. Uh, maybe there's, there's a big spot on there for all the vacations that you have had or, or are coming up. Uh, maybe there are some accomplishments um, that are sitting there as well. Maybe you have something in your heart for the, the weight that you've lost or sports accomplishments that you've uh, completed. Maybe you have something for a successful completion of a, of a treatment program. Uh, there's even room for things that you, that you know that you wouldn't want to mention out loud, but maybe there's places in your heart for them too. Maybe there's someone out there that uh, is excited about how many beers you can drink before you get buzzed, or how far you've gotten with somebody who you're not married to or how you have or continue to get away with some of the things that you're getting away with. We all have those things on our hearts that uh, show our identity, and they are all full. But the question that we are faced with today is whether or not the Lord is on the shelf of your heart. Is he on that shelf? Is he not only just on there, but is he in the place of supremacy in your heart? Is he ha does he have the prime real estate of that spot in you? The goal today is to realize that God will not be anyone's participation trophy. He will not be just another thing that we can collect, that collects dust on the shelf, that we can say, you know, I've been there, I've done that, I've been to church, I've received Jesus, and now I'm just going to move on. Rather, he commands us to see him as the self-sufficient, sovereign Lord over all things, by whom all things need to bow down and worship. And he will make sure that his name is praised, and he'll do whatever he deems necessary to make that happen. And we'll see that in two different ways today. The first is that we need to remove the false gods. We need to remove the false gods. First Samuel uh, 5 takes a dramatic shift in both scene and perspective here. Whereas the first four chapters are primarily dealing with Israel uh, up to this point, the scene now rests on God dealing with the Philistines. And in both cases, the Lord is making sure that both sides, Israelites and Philistines alike, know who he is and that he will be no one's good luck charm, nor will he be anyone's trophy. Now, the scene leading up to this particular vignette here uh, is one in which uh, Israel had just gone to war with the Philistines and initially lost 4,000 soldiers. And they run back to their barracks and they try to figure out what happened. And they rightly come to the conclusion that they lost the battle not because they were, uh, they were lower in their weapons or in their fighting strategy. They lost the battle because God wanted them to lose. The entire nation had morally abandoned him. Its leadership uh, was, uh, was totally corrupt. But in their minds, the only thing that they needed God for was those tough times. When they're in a pinch, that if they just call upon God, then he will come and rescue them in a heartbeat. So uh, though they had totally disregarded him in their, in their hearts and in their everyday lives, they then be uh, believed that if they brought the ark of the Lord, which is like this wooden box that they believe that God's uh, presence was stored in, it was the national symbol of Israel, uh, if they could just bring that box out to the battlefield, then they were 
surely guaranteed to win against the Philistines. But they were wrong. And they had to lose the hard way. This time, they lost 30,000 soldiers. Both of the high priest's sons were killed in the battle. And to their chagrin, the Ark of the Covenant was taken by the Philistines. No, this was a national disaster. Apart from the loss of all the lives, the big deal was that in, in their minds, God lost. He lost the battle. He was not what they had thought. In reality, he was actually greater, but he was teaching them that he is to be treasured and revered, not used and abused. And so now as the reader, we would expect that the story would continue with Israel. And we can imagine that they are on high alert right now because they've just lost 30,000 people. The Philistines have God, and it could be very easy that they will come in and invade us and we are toast. But the author instead fixes our gaze on a nation of people who have yet to learn about who Israel's God is. Let's look in verse 1. After the Philistines had captured the ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod, brought it into the temple of Dagon, and placed it next to a statue. So the ark moves from Ebenezer about 35 miles southwest to the city of Ashdod, which was a chief city, if not the chief city, uh, of the, the Philistines. It was there that the temple of Dagon uh, was, was located. Um, this was not uh, an uncommon thing for nations to do. Back in the ancient Near East, uh, there were no secular countries. So most countries, in fact, all the countries in the ancient Near East, believed more so in God versus God when it comes to, uh, to battle. And so when a nation would defeat another nation, one of the things that they would do is they would capture the nation's God, which was usually a physical object, and take it back to their temple as a trophy for what they had done in battle in defeating, that their God was stronger than this other god. Now, you, you see this in guys' basements all the time when they have uh, deer mounted up in, the, up in the basement or in the garage or whatever. Uh, this is their trophy for their victory, and this is exactly what the Philistines were doing. And this wasn't just any trophy case. This was a shrine to the god Dagon and that all the, the gods surrounding him were evidence that he had power and superiority. The ark wasn't just among equals here. It was meant to be a display that, God, that Israel's God was weak and wimpy and that Dagon had defeated him. But our Lord God would not allow such a thing. Again, he will be no one's prize. He will be no one's trophy. Look in verse 3. When the people of Ashdod got up early the next morning, there was Dagon, fallen with his face to the ground before the ark. So they took Dagon and returned him to his place. So whereas the Philistines placed the ark of the covenant in subjugation to Dagon, sometime during the night, the Lord saw to it that the Philistines would truly see who he was and that he was on top. The text says that Dagon had fallen with his, with his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. Now, this is clear and in no uncertain terms, placed in such a way that Dagon is lying prostrate towards the Lord. This is the Philistine God now that is bowing down in worship to the one true and living God. The Lord alone is God. Now, notice the irony here. The people that came in the morning probably thought nothing of it. Uh, they come in and they see Dagon's laying on the ground. Uh, perhaps there was an earthquake. Perhaps there was a really big uh, wind that went through the temple. And they don't recognize the serious of the threat 
to their understanding of the world. And the irony here is that the God that they thought was so powerful and so mighty that could defeat the God of the Israelites needs to be picked up by human hands and put back on the shelf. This is the God who took out the great God, who brought plagues on Egypt, who opened up the Red Sea, who has defeated every single enemy that Israel faced. And yet, he needs help. A powerful God indeed, not like the God of the ark. This is a God who does not need anyone or anything. This is a God who, unlike the, the pantheon of the ancient Near East, doesn't need to be fed. This is a God who didn't need to be nor could be manipulated to work for you. This is a God who is self-sufficient, self-sustaining, the creator of the universe. And how often is it that we mistake God, the Lord of heaven and earth, to be more like Dagon than who he is? How many of us approach our relationship to God as if he needs just a little bit of help? How many of us look at him as if he created all of this because he was lonely and needed us? How many of us live our lives as if God exists as nothing more than a spiritual vending machine? That if we just stick a couple quarters in, well, probably five or six quarters nowadays, but if you put those quarters in and something would fall to the ground and then you get what you want. And hey, if the Snickers bar gets stuck a little bit, you can shake it and you can pound it until you get what you ordered, right? Some of us approach God in that same way. But our God is not Dagon. Our God tells us in Psalm 50 verse 12, he says, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you for the world and everything in it. it it's mine. I own it. Paul tells us in Acts 17, the God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by hands, neither is he served by human hands as if he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. So if there's anything that we need to realize from these verses is that God does not need us to pick him up and put him on the shelf. That is his job. He is, Psalm 115 tells us, he is in heaven and he does whatever he pleases. So these guys pick him up, they put him on the table or on the shelf or whatever it is and verse five then tells us what happened that night. It says, but when they got up early the next morning, there was Dagon, fallen with his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they wake up, and, and here again is he's worshiping the Lord. This time, Dagon's head and both of his hands were broken off, lying on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso remained. <laughs> now, this would be easy for us to see simply as a coincidence, right? Because if, if one of our precious moments figures or, or willow, willow tree uh, things fell onto the ground, the same thing would happen. But this is not any sort of coincidence. Dagon had probably never fell before. And yet, this is two nights in a row. And the first night was the very first night that the ark of the God of the Israelites came over for a slumber party. Something is different here. Now, decapitation and dismemberment, as gruesome as it sounds, was quite frequent in the ancient Near East in, in war times. They would do these things and um, take them back either as trophies or they would take these parts back for body counts of how many uh, people were killed in, in battle. And so what we find here that the point is, is that God is telling the Philistines that there is no other God. And that he is victorious over even the mighty Dagon. 
Not only are all the systems and peoples of the world to bow down in submission and worship, but God is more powerful and he is more mighty than they ever could have imagined. And this teaches us something too, that God will not play second fiddle to anything in our lives. He deserves to be number one in our lives. That's the very first commandment. You shall have no other gods if there were other gods before me. He is teaching us that unless we get rid of the idols in our hearts and in our lives, or at least take them from their idol status and place them in their proper place in our lives, then he will certainly be relentless to make sure that his name is praised. And what are those idols? They're anything in your life that you are prioritizing before God. And we ought to put them away or put them in their proper place. So we need to get rid of the idols. But then after that, we need to recognize the supremacy of God. Recognize the supremacy of God. So God is in the business of making his name great. And he started here in the temple, which was the heart of the country. And now he is moving into the streets. And the language here is very interesting, starting in verse 6. It says that the Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod. Now, again, we need to remember that in, uh, in Scripture, and especially in these Old Testament narratives, details matter. There are fine details in these stories that we ought to pay attention to. Remember that Dagon had just lost his hands. Hands were a symbol of strength and, and, and might and power. And now the Lord here is fully ambidextrous, whose hand is now heavy on the people. And last week we went into detail about the word play between the word heavy and the word glory. It's the Hebrew words kavod and kavod. They sound very, very similar. And now the, the word is coming back that God is putting a heavy hand down on the Philistines. And how is he heavy handed? Look in verse six again. He terrified the people of Ashdod and its territory and afflicted them with tumors. Now put yourself in the Philistines position here. Like, you, uh, your God, who protected you and won great battles, is now destroyed at the hands of a God whom they were all well aware of, once put some nasty boils on some Egyptians and many other plagues. They're utterly terrified. And they do what any one of us would reasonably expect. They call for this ark to get out of Dodge. Now let's look in verse 7 and 8. When the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, The ark of Israel's God must not stay here with us because his hand is strongly against us and our God Dagon. So they called all the Philistine rulers together and asked, what should we do with the Ark of Israel's God? The Ark of Israel's God should be moved to Gath, they replied. So they moved the Ark to Israel's, uh, <laughs> the Ark of Israel's God. And the, the chain of events here is almost humorous. Like they have no idea what to do uh, with this object here. Ashdod was the, the chief city of the country here. And they're ready to pass this thing off onto anybody as long as it's not around there. You know, it'd be like, think about uh, if, if something like this would be in Minneapolis and, and Mayor Jacob Fry were to say something like, oh, I mean, get this thing out of Minneapolis. Go send it to Woodbury or go send it to Golden Valley or go send it to, to Egan or something. Just, I don't care where it goes as long as it's not here. Verses 8 through 12 then finishes off what happens. So they called all the Philistine rulers together and asked, what should we do with the Ark of Israel's God? The, uh, Israel's God should be moved to Gath. They replied, so they moved the Ark of Israel's God. After that, after they had moved it, the Lord's hand was against the city of Gath, causing a great panic. Well, I'd panic too if I knew what had happened in the other city. 
He afflicted the people of the city from the youngest to the oldest with an outbreak of tumors. The people of Gath then sent the ark of God to Ekron. But when it got to the Ekronites, cried out, They've moved the ark of Israel's God to kill us and our people. The, the Ekronites called all the Philistine rulers together. And they said, Send the ark of Israel's God away. Let it return to its place so it won't kill us and our people. For the fear of death pervaded the city. God's hand was oppressing them. Those who did not die were afflicted with tumors, and the outcry of the city went up to heaven. So, wherever the ark goes, there's trouble. And the trouble was purposeful. God was teaching the Philistines, and he's teaching us as well, that God not only humbles and slays the idols of the world, but he also judges the people who serve them. They realized that their problem was not medical and it was not psychological. Their problem was moral and relational and spiritual. They didn't know this God. They didn't fear him. They didn't serve him. They didn't respect him. But again, God is relentless to make sure that his name is praised. And he has called Israel to be a light, a blessing to the nations so that they would all see and know that he alone is God. But Israel failed in that. And so now God causes them to lose a battle so that he can go into the world and show the nations that he indeed is supreme. And we need to see him as such too. We live in a world that is surrounded by modern day Philistines. This is a culture that believes that they have hijacked the one true and living God. And that they have tamed him put him on the shelf with all the other perverse gods of the world. They have made him into a modern-day Dagon who is anything but demanding. Rather, this is a God who is accommodating. He's okay with living among your idols. It's a God who doesn't care how you use your money. It's a God who doesn't care what you're doing with your computer. It's a God who doesn't care who you're attracted to or what your chosen pronouns are. This is a God who honors the choice to end your pregnancy. It's a God who applauds your social media rants and your lack of self-control and your gossip and slander. This is a God that is available for your beck and call and will never disrupt your life nor your conscience. Any threat to this cultural God is met with a swift army at Ekron ready to take out 40,000 of your own troops, 30,000. And given the way that things are going, you might ask, where is then the true and living God? And you might answer that by saying he's captured. He's gone. He's defeated. But look to 1 Samuel 5. God's doing just fine. He's not hurt at all. He's not offended. He is the God who is doing what he is doing. He proved it in this passage, and he proved it ultimately in his son, Jesus Christ, whom is, who God, who is God himself, who is the true ark of God. And when he was nailed to the cross, the equivalent of the first century Philistines thought that they had a trophy on their hands. Jesus was dead. They defeated their greatest enemy. He was placed in the temple of Dagon. Jesus was placed into the tomb. And he rose victorious. And in the process, dismembered our idols and even death itself. Forty days later, he ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And when we look out at our world today, it certainly doesn't seem as if God, uh, doesn't it seem as if God has entered back into Dagon's temple? We're surrounded by these Philistines. And the direction that we are heading is only into destruction. 
We may not see what's happening in the temple behind the scenes, as the Philistines did not see what was happening behind the scenes. But one thing that we do know for sure is first that Jesus is redeeming a people unto himself. He is making himself known. He is glorifying himself. People are becoming Christians and converting to knowing the one true and living God at all times, in all places, in the most dark places. The gospel is waking people up to what is truly going on. People are being rescued from their sin and their eternal death. And second, we know that Jesus is coming back to show his supremacy over all false gods. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10 says that the word of God rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place that your faith in God has gone out. Therefore, we don't need to say anything, for they themselves report what kind of reception we had from you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues from the coming wrath. Revelation chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Even those Philistines that took him and put him in that temple. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come, the Almighty. And Jesus tells us himself in Revelation chapter 22, verses 12 through 13. Look, I am coming again soon, and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Friends, you are here to recognize the worth and the supremacy of Christ and to glorify him in that. That's your life purpose. That's it. And you can't do that when you put him on the shelf with other gods. Jesus will not be a participation trophy among all the other things in life. He alone is supreme. He alone is worthy of our affection. He alone died and rose from the dead to destroy anything that seeks to share its glory. And today, right now, will you take an inventory of your spiritual shelf? When you look at all the things in your life that you honor and glory uh, and, and glorify, how many of them are taking up the glory, the weight, the heaviness that belongs to Jesus and Jesus alone? What in your life does Jesus not have lordship over? Friends, now is the time to put those away and worship Jesus and him alone. The stakes are high, but the glory is great. Trust in him and him alone. Let's pray. Father, these words are, are tough and we, we, we don't always enjoy being confronted with our idols and the idols of our culture. But Lord, we desperately need you. Lord, we are like the Israelites of old. Lord, we may feel like you're not present with us. You're not powerful. We don't see you moving. But it may just be, Lord, that you are somewhere that we cannot see, destroying things that we cannot imagine. And so, Father, I pray that you would be working in our hearts and in our lives and in our minds to be putting aside those idols and to be putting Christ on the throne of our hearts and our lives where he belongs. Father, as we move into this time of remembering you and your gospel through the Lord's Supper, through communion, Lord, that we would do so in a worthy manner. Help us to repent of our sins, things that we may be holding on to and are struggling to loosen our grip. God, would you take your gentle hand and open us up to the truth about ourselves 
and the truth of you. And it's in Jesus' name we ask this. Amen.